what I'm trying to do here is try, try to um, push a little, little away at the surface of our discussions to try and get at the beginnings of difference and at the beginnings of cultural interaction. And that sounds a kind of weird project at one level because, you know, how do you put a date on something like that? And so in a way, it's a kind of cultural history but I also felt, well, we haven't really thought, we know about strangers on the one hand and other in, and we also know about how we interact and hybridization. And I thought, well, maybe we can try and dig a little deeper and see where these images of the other and where these points of convergence actually began historically. So that's what the paper is about. My second part of the paper, which is a little bit more difficult to sustain, because I haven't really worked that through, is that these origins of difference and origins of convergence are actually the vocabulary, the repertoire that we draw on in contemporary discussions. So that bridge between what I'm talking about and contemporary needs to be made a little bit more explicit, and maybe that will come out in some of the discussions. Okay, so this is called, really, Before the Welcoming, and it starts with the hypothesis that we actually have two dominant narratives that are completely contradictory. One is that human beings have always been at each other's throat, that we're pretty ugly, creatures that we gang up in little clusters, ethnic, religious, clan, family, and short of uh, some really powerful structure that knocks our heads together and says, you have to learn to live together, we are prone to kill each other and hate each other. And that narrative, which I'll come on to and see if I can find the point at which it becomes you know, a part of the dominant discourse in Europe in particular, is opposed completely by a kind of timeless, rather vague hybridization thesis, which we all feel intuitively we would like to be part of. We'd like to be part of, and Daniela alluded to this a little bit in her introduction, um, we'd all like to be part of that creative energy that draws people together from different backgrounds into new um, energetic, powerful, creative syntheses that are positive. So we don't, we look, look back, we don't, we look forward, we look to new energies and so on. So we're not basically, we don't intrinsically hate each other with a little bit of goodwill and in the right circumstances, we can actually begin to create. Now, think about it for a moment. That's actually pretty two divergent views of the world. And I thought, okay, where does that all begin and how do we kind of spell that out? Well, of course, where it all begins is that we once all one species, we are all one species, but we all began at a particular point, and there's various um, you know, narratives now, and scientists are not quite sure exactly. We all pretty agree that we come from Africa, but it depends on what point at which you describe a, a human being um, as opposed to a hominid who were our joint ancestors with the great apes. And for a long time, people thought about the Great Rift Valley, but now the latest Scientific American, at least, version is that we're all from the Namibian South African um, border. And I've been there. And um, Stephanie, where are you? You've probably been there too. Um, it's a rather wild, dramatic um, rock desert. I camped there in a dry riverbed and uh, 
the wake up in the morning and, the, and rolled over. The tent had gone over and over and over again. I didn't realize. Fortunately, I was asleep. I ended up in a different place. <laughs> but um, it's um, little strange plants, little tiny lichens, about 60 or 70 forms of grass. But at that point, it supported diverse life, la la life um, the diverse um, genetic um, human population, <coughs> which then got thinned out as people dispersed and perhaps as few as 150 people, so the thesis goes, crossed the land bridge in the Red Sea um, and to populate the rest of the world. It's an extraordinary narrative. <laughs> what the hell happened thereafter? That's where it becomes interesting. So I'm going to go into three versions, biblical, historical, and scientific. Now, the biblical one is, I think, interesting for a number of reasons. This is the narrative um, from Genesis, and you can all read it. I'm not going to read it out. But the depiction of Babylon, three or four major artistic depictions, um, all suggest that what was happening is that human beings were converging, according to the biblical story, in order to build steps up to heaven where they could, you know, interrogate God. And God looked at this <coughs> behavior, this effrontery, and it's a bit like the story of Eden, really, uh, uh, you know, the post-Lapsarian view of that. This is absolutely terrible thing for human beings to aspire to. So he confused their tongues, and they could no longer speak to each other. And thus, um, Babylon, or Babel in particular, the Tower of Babel, which has some historical precedence, the ziggurats that were built in the Mesopotamian Valley about 2,900 years ago, um, these were actually had to be smashed by a confusion of tongues. And the great Scottish anthropologist, James Fraser, who did lots of comparative work at the end of the 19th century, and he found there were lots of similar stories Islamic civilization, African civilization, the uh, Andaman Islands, uh, various Pacific civilizations, people building structures in order to reach, um, to reach some sort of higher heaven and to, as we're fine. Now, what's intriguing is that this Tower of Babylon story has become part of our contemporary culture. I'll give you just two examples. One is uh, Elton John's lyrics to his song, um, Tower of Babel. It's party time for the, the guys in the Tower of Babel. Sodom met Gomorrah, Cain met Abel. Have a ball, ye all, see the leeches crawl. When the call girls under the table watch them dig their graves, cause Jesus don't save guys in the Tower of Babel. So Babel then had a kind of image of sin human sin. And it also had an image of vaulting human ambition, which was inappropriate. And quite interestingly, a Syrian-American sculptor, her name is Diana al-Hadid, links the Tower of Babel to the events of 9-11. According to the Sachi Gallery description, her, sculpt scu her sculptures of towers signify ideas of progress and globalism but are both in legend, such as the Tower of Babel, and in reality, such as the horrors of the World Trade Center attacks, symbols of the problems of cultural difference and conflict. Okay. And perhaps a third, if I've got a moment, um, a poem by a poet called Leonard Schwartz. Babel, of course, is the fall of a tower, followed by a vast manipulated confusion of words. Babel is language beginning before it is a language, while it's still song. As Babel is both grown, ground and zero, cipher, cipher, gallicize zero, let us call it ground zero. Babel is defiance, hubris of the heart, ziggurat aimed at sons, unborn. The smoke contains bodies, we breathe one another. Thus Babel is Kabul, we breathe one another. Okay, so draws that biblical story right into the contemporary narrative. That this is about confusion. 
are endemic and human, human uh, attempts at solidarity creating more confusion. Okay, now that's the biblical account. We also, of course, have historical and quasi-scientific accounts of cultural difference. And the easiest way to express it is that if you're a social historian, you would say, as people disperse, they find new terrains, they meet new challenges. Sometimes it's cold, sometimes it's hot, sometimes there are mountains, sometimes there are beaches, sometimes there are valleys, and sometimes they have to adapt to these in environmental uh, circumstances. And gradually, they become different. They get cut off from groups that were once, um, you know, they were, they were part of, the sea changes, the configuration changes, and so, as where difference arises through migration. Perfectly sensible and plausible account. Darwin had a go at it, the origin of species, or uh, actually spectacularly didn't have a go at it. Um, he announces that you will find in this account some explanation for human variability, but in fact he never provides it. Now, the reason why he pulls his punches is almost certainly because, um, you know, he was a Christian gentleman and he was a bit reluctant to pull out some of the implications of his argument. And he has another go at it later on when his reputation is established. But quite uh, interestingly, Darwin suggests that the genetic account for variability is likely to be because people abandon abandon natural selection in favor of other mating preferences. So human beings may choose people not because of natural selection, but because they are attracted to them. And that then accounts for human variability. Okay, it may, you know, just to explain that more simply, it would be genetically more efficient if, let's say, a rather weedy, um, person who was used to only working in one climate um, married or had sexual relations with somebody who was able to work in a number of climates. Okay, So in fact, diversity would have produced better choice uh, in terms of natural selection and they may have been over, uh, may have trumped. So Darwin actually makes a counterintuitive um, argument that um, just uh, alludes to a, a, a discovery of a hominid called Lucy. I won't have time to go into that. But my argument, I suppose, that I want to focus in on is that cultural differences arise particularly in the modern era. And by the modern era, I'm just simply starting from um, Columbus, in 1492, crosses the Atlantic, and Chang He, who explores the um, Indian Ocean, particularly from 1405 to 33. So I want to be, as it were, ensure that this isn't a, a purely European uh, description of, of the world, and to bring into play this very important um, uh, Chinese explorer, uh, Chang He. But bearing in mind, of course, that the Chinese emperor at one point pulls this back. So whereas it was pretty clear that the Chinese and the Arabs and other groups were actually engaging in parallel forms of voyages of discovery for all kinds of complicated internal politics, they don't really expand into empires. And so Europe, Europe is significant. So it's not just a matter of saying this is cultural imperialism to focus on Europe. It's because parallel developments in China and the Arabian Peninsula didn't go as far as the European voyages of discovery, which then turned into the, an, an imperial uh, adventure. OK, so that's when modernity begins. Now, why do I focus on that? It's because, for the first time since the 200,000 years ago in the Namibian desert, people begin to collide with each other. There is much greater connectivity. Okay? From those separations, 
people begin to bounce into each other through trade, imperialism, voyages of discovery. <coughs> and in that bouncing together, in that encounter, those sets of cultural encounters, both difference and the overcoming of difference uh, begin to arise. Figures of the time, and I mean, I'm taking Thomas Hobbes as a representative figure in the 16th century and uh, Captain Cook in the, um, uh, in the 18th, 16th, 17th and Cat, uh, Cook in the 18th, um, two kinds of versions of the other become dominant. One is the one that I've alluded to right at the beginning of the talk, which is that human beings are actually pretty difficult customers. They don't get on with each other in the state of nature, which is this mythical place that uh, philosophers of the time needed in order to make their arguments, um, says um, Thomas Hobbes, the life of man, human beings, is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. And, he says, the only thing that stops that happening is the Leviathan, this powerful state, which steps in and says to people, you can't just go around wandering around killing people in gangs. This force of the state is going to stop you. We are going to have the monopoly of the means of violence. And we will seek to enforce something that is in the end interests of the greater whole. That's the first version. The second version is the Captain Cook version. That is an... I would say soft primitivism, which is basically the natives are fine and happy and the coconuts are falling down and leave them alone and they're basically okay. okay so the Euro Europeans are invading their space. Now there's a whole story about Captain Cook, which I wish, I wish I could spend some time on because of course he gets killed and, and the question of whether he was eaten is a very, very intriguing question. Um, but I, and maybe we'll have a, have a chance of coming back to that because it's not quite clear that this cannibal talk was actually happening, was there were actual cannibals or whether there were Europeans who thought these people were cannibals and kind of invented the whole thing. And there's a brilliant book called Cannibal Talk, which I would recommend for the, those of you who really want to get into the subject deeply. It's a very complex book about, you know, all these sailors arrive out of this, uh, from Captain Cook's um, thing, and they're, they're all half starving and ragged, and they eat like pigs, you know, it's all gaining like this, and the, these Hawaiians are looking at them and saying, what's going on here? And then they start saying, are you guys cannibals? Are you guys cannibals? And they think, maybe these guys are cannibals. In other words, they think the Europeans are cannibals, and it all gets something very complicated. So a lot of confusion is going on there, which is all part of this rich um, thing going on. And indeed, European social and political theory seems to be refracted in these different experiences, real experiences were different, as you might imagine. You're bumping into all these different groups all over the world. Some of them says, hey, great, look, we've got strangers. This looks interesting. Come and join us. You know, like, you know, we'll dance around together and you know, have a hand, we'll have a wonderful time. And other groups say, oh, we don't actually like you guys coming, this is our patch, and throw a few spears at them. So you would imagine that there could be differences, but these differences, of course, then become magnified and the assumptions that arise from these differences and the stories that go back then constitute some of, something of the heartland of social and political theory um, in the European um, setting. Uh, I'm just going to spend literally a minute or so describing one or two of them. Um, so let me just see whether I can find it um, here. I'll just go on, there, there's one example. Um, so, uh, South Coastal Chinese, and this of course didn't happen one way only, it wasn't European images of the other, it was also the people who saw these Europeans for the first time, saying what the hell are these people? Coastal Chinese, for example, believed that Europeans were genetically prone to um, constipation. This explained their corpulence. 
without voluminous supplies of rhubarb, so they thought to, pursue, to purge their bodies, they would swell up and explode. <laughs> However, this uh, human propensity for curiosity and mimicry allowed many people to to overcome their initial apprehension of strangers. In 1788, when the British fleet hove to at a place subsequently known as Botany Bay, one Lieutenant William Bradley had his first meeting with indigenous Australians. They were unarmed and friendly, and commented Bradley, these people mixed with ours and all hands danced together. In a later watercolour, Bradley depicts the dancing as similar to that of children, hand in hand at a picnic. On another more famous encounter, the Beagle, which was the scientific ship that um, Darwin um, was on, entered the Bay of Tierra de Fuego in 1832. The na young naturalist Charles Bo Bo Darwin had absorbed the myth of the ferociously savage Fuegans. I could not have believed, says Darwin, how wide was the difference between the savage and the civilized man. The expression of their countenance were distrustful, surprised, and startled. This did not last for long. Competitive faceful pulling, singing, dancing followed these un in unintelligible outcries. The British party imitated these antics, but the astonished Fuegans soon, soon joined in, and we were soon able to imitate the waltz. By the evening, Darwin tells us, we parted very good friends, which I think was fortunate, for the dialogue, the dancing and skylarking had occasionally bordered on a trial of strength. So, quite an interesting account here of the way people begin to communicate with each other. This um, emphasis I've given you two examples on dancing is quite fascinating because it seems to come up quite often. And you can see the problem is they don't have a language in common, so they begin to create <laughs> some kind of, you know, expressions and so on, so some in, in, indications of friendliness. The botanist on board the ship thought, you know, it would work. Now, you can understand what crazy communications are going on in people's head or miscommunication, misapprehensions. He said, well, I thought it would be friendly if I pulled my trousers down and painted my penis with charcoal, which then would show that I was sort of somehow you know, relating to them. And of course, they got the wrong idea and didn't know what the hell he was on about. And so, so, you know, so there we go in, in this kind of this comedy of errors and mischances and miscommunication and, and absolute astonishment. I mean, the, the Brits at one point landed some bit, bit of Australia and the locals um, burst out into Le Marseillais, the French, you know, anthem. And they can't work this out and they have some wild theory that perhaps you know, this part of the world was once part of France. They didn't know, they didn't know what the hell there was going on because it was some French sailor who'd been stranded there and, you know, and so it goes on. All right, so a lot of misapprehension, a lot of miscommunication, which goes on in these encounters and, and very, very complex things feeding back um, into Europe. And of course, most, amongst the most important things that are going on are those which are to do with settlement and European, not just the voyages, but, and not just the trading things, but when people begin to penetrate these societies. And this famous figure, Bartholomew de Casas, um, who was a Dominican priest, big owner of a large economy, Hacienda of some sort in uh, Latin America, who then um, de persuades the Pope that these indigenous Americans, known as Indios, because of course Columbus thought he reached India, so it was a misapprehension, red Indians and local, local people being called Indians, um, that these Indios were indeed human beings, therefore they had to be saved, um, and if they were saved, and, converted by force, which he opposed, and so he spent the rest of his life trying to, through missionary activity, convert these folk into um, saved Christians. And a very interesting figure. And I suppose, taking the narrative on a little bit, by the end of the 18th century, you really begin to get, in the European context, 
two um, divergent strategies about how to deal with the other. One is you make people, like you've seen in the Bartholomew de las Casas example, like yourselves, as much like yourselves as possible. Okay? And the other is you recognize difference. Right. So I symbolize the first position by referring to Napoleon who is able to motivate his troops, apparently, by saying to them as they are invading Egypt, come on, lads, we're fighting for civilization. Which, of course, is defined in the French Revolution as a universal human attribute. Everybody, potentially, was part of this civilization. It was, generally speaking, French-speaking. Yeah, but uh, there you go. Everybody was part of it, and uh, it could be enforced by um, you know pers persuasion, and if not persuasion, then military might. So it's to draw people into the civilization, and to the singular civilization. And on the other hand, this is a distinction of often uh, Norbert, Norbert Elias made this distinction in his great book on the history of manners. Is it John? I can't remember this. What's uh, Norbert's uh, book, is it called The History of Manners? Or? History of Civilization. History of Civilization, perhaps, yeah. Um, uh, uh, in, in the, anyway, in that book, Norbert distinguishes between civilization, a la Napoleon, French Revolution, and culture, as in a rather particular uh, German um, uh, break, which is um, the idea of um, separate cultural development. And the cru crucial figure is, um, is Herder. And there's a picture of the, the said Herder. Uh, and what, of course, he, he did here, which I think was very, very important, was he breaks with the Christian tradition and with the revolutionary tradition and suggests that we should celebrate these differences of um, between cultures and, and civilization. So let me let me just read read this a little bit here. Um, now, pagan societies were not merely anticipations, but brimmed with their own kind of vivacity. The nation was individual and separate, distinguished to her by climate, education, foreign intercourse, tradition, and heredity. Providence he praised for having wonderfully separated nationalities, not only by woods and mountains, seas and deserts, rivers and climates, but more particularly by languages, inclinations, and characters. He praised the tribal outlook, writing that the savage who loves himself, his wife, and his children with a quiet joy and glows with limited activity of his tribe as for himself is, in my opinion, a more real being than the cultivated shadow who is enraptured in the shadow of the whole species. Every nation bears in itself the standard of its perfection, totally independent of all comparison with that of others. For do not nationalities differ in everything, in poetry, in appearance, in tastes, in usage, customs, and languages? Must not religion which partakes in these also differ amongst them? So a celebration of difference, which plays, of course, directly into anthropology as a discipline, and later on into our contemporary discussions of cultural relativism. Okay? So rather than that sense in which human beings must all come together or be forced together in a universal recognition, you recognize difference, you accept it, you celebrate it, you can see, of course, that it's a sort of version of soft primitivism. And quite interestingly, whereas for Herder, there was no hierarchical intent, you might say there was some hierarchical implication, for another great German philosopher, Immanuel Kant, who of course is associated with cosmopolitanism, the great precursor of, of cosmopolitanism in perpetual peace and so on, if you look at his lectures on geography as opposed to his lectures on philosophy and human progress, 
um, he turns out to be a bit of a racist. Um, and there it is. And as um, is said here, it's not uh, an isolated quotation, but a sample of his continuous discourse. Um, but look where, look at the narrative, the Negroes, the Hottentots, the Javanese, the people in the hot lands, people in, okay. So he's already aware of these travelers' tales. He's absorbing them in the most negative kind of possible way and beginning to refract them and create that images, those images of the other, which become organized into European social thought. Okay? And this is, you know, I emphasize again, this is the poster boy for cosmopolitanism. Okay, so just, just imagine what we're saying here. This is the guy who we've taken a symbolic of, this idea of a great human universal space. Okay, so that, that, that's a kind of interesting kind of thing. Now, before we say goodbye to this many cultures tradition, the Herderian uh, tradition, let me just say one or two good things about it, and you can see that I've listed them there, which suggests that, look, it's not all bad news. I mean, the <coughs> fact that people did want to respect difference, did say, look, you know, people do need to be left alone, blah, 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 did protect them from exploitative conduct by mining companies, by crazy missionaries, and so on. I'm not, I'm not saying it's all completely negative, but of course it did create that idea that human beings could be locked away into kind of zoos, um, you know, each in a different cage. And I think that is the sense in which um, I want to now move the debate on. And I do so, again, by reference to something that happened in early modernity, really in the 15th and 16th century, the beginnings of creolization or the amalgamation of cultures. So we've been talking about separation of cultures up to now, or if you like, the enforcement of a singular powerful culture, the Napoleonic guy on his horse and, you know, sort of saying, oh, we'll come to Egypt and we'll tell you how to be civilized, you rotten Egyptians. And uh, so what, what, what I'm suggesting in creolization, although this is not perfectly symmetrical, don't, I'm not making that argument, there are huge differences in power and, 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 and influence between partners. What happens in a Creole setting is that the two elements, or multiple elements, get together to create a third culture, dropping slowly the original culture and forming something new. And if you want to think about it as a language, when two peoples meet and they start to talk to each other, they, they point and say, what do you call that tree, that tree, that tree? Yes. And they develop a pigeon. It's a very limited vocabulary, but they can communicate. A little bit. But a pigeon grows into a creole when that becomes a dominant language and a mother tongue, which is then taught by mothers to their children, and the two original languages disappear or fade back. Okay, so that's what's happening when you have a creolization. Interestingly, if the first place I would say historically where there's a creole possibility is in um, Cape Verde or the Capo Verde Islands. And in particular, in this rather interesting place called Ciudad Velo, which was the largest city in the tropical world for quite some time. The Portuguese, of course, are notorious for um, not doing very well in their um, Merkant in their empire building in respect of leaving big imprints. They were great traders and they, given how small they were, they punched above their weight and so they were extraordinarily, they got around an awful lot. But they never really did much when they got there. And, but in this case, they really went for it. They were going to build bloody great city, cathedrals, goodness knows what else. And even there, in this pillory, where they would convert slaves uh, who refused to accept Catholicism. The kids play on it, they don't really know what it was. And they built this massive fort. There I am, there's the old guy doing some field work. And you see that in the fort is an African well, because the Africans taught them how to dig that well and to create that, that kind of round 
thing. So it was part of that cultural creolization. And if you look at that band across, what you're really getting is a, a set of creole languages which are just symbolic of these cultural interactions of all sorts. You know, not just language I'm talking about, but I'm also talking about social practices, religions, all kinds of things here. But it's just symbolic of it. And it tends to happen in that, um, you know, between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn, where, if you like, the south and the north meet, and new sorts of things happen. And they tend to go right along like that. Okay, so it strikes me that one way we can take this debate forward then is to say that at this moment of early modernity, the negative, soft and hard primitivism, the enlightened, enforced enlightenment versus the multicultures tradition are producing these kinds of differences and creolization, by contrast, of producing the, is producing the con contrary, that's to say the possibility of engagement by people in the manufacture of a third space. Now, this means that you've got new cultures, new identities, new religions, new languages emerging that are neither from one culture nor the other. Okay? And as I suggested, although these occur under conditions of brutality, I showed you a picture of the pillory where the slaves were beaten, and often in the context of the New World where there was plantation societies, nonetheless, it remains a dialogical process, so the slaves don't become totally humiliated, don't abandon totally their original um, characters and dispositions and cultural backgrounds, nor do the Europeans become totally dominant, because they in turn become creolized. And interestingly enough, the word creole in the context of Spanish America was used of whites initially. So these were people who were not, as in the Spanish and Portuguese case, they, they were not going back to the, to, to the Iberian Peninsula. They were not peninsulares. So the distinction was between peninsulares and criollos. Criollos were the people who decided, we're going to stay here in Cuba, in Latin America, in the Caribbean, in Louisiana, and so on. Okay? So this is a, a very interesting um, example. All right, so now, um, I suppose this is the bit where I don't have that much time for, and I admit is not well developed in the argument yet. So I'm just sort of getting there. I haven't quite got there yet. It seems to me that these two rival narratives of cultural difference and cultural convergence do now come into our own discussions. I mean, Daniela in her opening expression were, were, was, was talking about how we now are beginning to recognize hybridity and um, crossovers and cross-nationalism and transnationalism and so on. But of course, at the same time, as she indicated, we're also going through a period of massive exclusion. So we are beginning to develop a narrative about how we keep people out how others are really others, how they're different, how they can't be assimilated, how they can't be amalgamated, they can't be realized because they are fundamentally different. And so we've got that dualism, that parallelism that I've referred to from early modernity running right through um, this, this uh, discussion. And then that's uh, one example there. It also runs through, and I'm not going to spend time on this because it's, um, it's an old saw and people spend a lot of time analyzing Samuel P. Huntington, but it is perhaps just important to allude to it that the contemporary form of cultural difference narrative is really the clash of civilizations, which is the phrase that he uh, put into common usage, um, a phrase that is now important not merely because it was some great right-wing probably flawed thesis, I mean, totally flawed or 
nearly flawed, nearly entirely flawed thesis, but because it's actually become part of the logic of state power. That's what these wars in Afghanistan and elsewhere are about, is, the, is taking on board exactly this kind of um, narrative and accepting that as the reality of the world, that we've got civilizational conflict. So important that we mention that. We also find, I suggest, that cultural difference is now being manipulated and to some degree overcome for commercial reasons. So you've got strategic, political, and now, um, and these rather interesting <coughs> adverts from HSBC, which is the biggest bank in Britain, and now one of the biggest banks in Britain, and certainly one of the biggest in the world, and not many people still realize that the acronym is Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation, so it has good um, Eastern origins, but it's become, recently they've used some very smart um, people to manipulate the image, and this one, fixed saving rates that won't budge, is the picture of this Japanese sumo wrestler, only it turns out on interrogation because people challenged it, it's not a Japanese sumo wrestler at all. It's an overweight white guy <laughs> who has got a Japanese wig on him and has been sort of painted for the occasion. <laughs> so it managed to upset a whole lot of Japanese people who were able to detect that this guy was really a fake, as it were. But also that kind of thing that you see in Heathrow Airport, they had a whole lot of strips as you came in, trendy, traditional, traditional, trendy, trying to reverse and counterpose images, what is, what is modern, what is backward, what is primitive, what is advanced, what is trendy, and so on. So they keep on trying to play with this. Um, and so it's become, if you like, a source of manipulation and so on. So that's, if you like, the playful note, which brings me really to my uh, conclusion. So we have a, a common origin. We all, come, we all come out of Africa. We were born there. We all probably got on reasonably well with each other there, then. But as we moved out of the continent, we began to diverge in all kinds of ways, genetically, culturally, social practices, and visibly, of course, in terms of languages. Uh, however, what I suggest is those differences became codified and magnified in those early encounters in early modernity, when people began to connect with each other in unexpected ways, and all those comedies and peculiarities of representation and misrepresentation and cannibal talk and all the rest of it began to take on. Take on. At the same time as that was happening, those comedies of mis misunderstanding each other, there was also at a, one level the process of converge, convergence to some degree. Okay, An in incomplete convergence, otherwise of course we'd all be happy, slappy, friendly characters all getting on terribly well with each other and unfortunately as we look around the world we realize that isn't true. But what I would suggest is, is in trying to theorize, trying to understand what we do when we welcome a stranger or we repel a stranger, and Levi Strauss has this rather vivid imagery where he says you really as a receiving society have two options one you can swallow the foreign body or you can vomit it out yeah that process of what we more politely call inclusion and exclusion <laughs> welcoming or rejecting that those processes are actually derived from that early modern era when we began to learn how not to get on with each other <coughs> and how, a little bit, to get on with each other. So that's it.